moving on uh, to our topics for the show, I got a couple of things uh, I'd like to discuss uh, today. Uh, the first of which is um, a really interesting article that was in the Washington Post this week by Terrence McCoy. I'm not going to tell. I'm not going to read the title because it's going to give it away. I just want to read from the beginning of this article, and uh, you'll get the picture pretty pretty soon. So this is uh, Terrence McCoy writing in the Washington Post, Dateline, Winder, Georgia, or Winder. I don't know. I'll say probably both Winder. Hope, uh, Pro- Winder, Georgia. God damn it! God damn it! <laughs> Will, uh, the- what was the whole thing about doing better? Remember that? Uh, I caught myself. I caught myself. He's not perfect. He's growing. Yeah. Let him grow. Uh, but actually, both of you are wrong. I'm a the, grower, not a shower. The the I in this town's name is silent. It's wonder. <laughs> reading from reading now. It says, all Jim Cooley wants to do is buy some soda. You want to come to Walmart, he asks his wife. No, Maria says. Pretty please, Jim asks. I'm not going to sit there and have the police called on you. I mean, I don't want to see that crap, Maria says, knowing what a trip to Walmart means. She knows her 51-year-old husband has two guns inside the house, and this afternoon it won't be the 9 millimeter, which he straps on with a round in the chamber when grabbing lunch at his favorite fast food restaurant or visiting a friend's auto shop. It'll be the AR-15 semi-automatic rifle, which he brings when going somewhere he thinks is dangerous, like the Atlanta airport, where he's taken it loaded with a 100-bullet drum, or Walmart, where he thinks crowds could pose easy targets for terrorists. Now, like I said, I, I, you know what the article's about. The headline here is, In Jim Cooley's Open Carry America, even a trip to Walmart can require an AR-15. And what I love about this article is that like the, the beginning of it is like a, just a beautiful like single scene play. And I just want to finish this scene between Jim Cooley and his wife, Maria. Oh, I got to get soda. Maria sighs. She worked the night before assembling air conditioner compressors at a nearby factory. And in a few hours, she knows she'll have to leave for a third shift. Yeah, she says, giving in. I might as well get this travesty out of the way. What travesty? You carrying a big old rifle in the store, scaring the hell out of all the Walmart shoppers. There's no difference between carrying a rifle and carrying a handgun, he says. You tried that last time, remember, Maria says, stepping into a pair of flip-flops and running her fingers through her hair. And what happened? Barrow County Sheriffs, three or four of them. They can't tell me what and what not to carry, Jim says. You know I wouldn't listen to them anyway. Well, you go one way in the store, I'll go the other, Maria says. Then when they say, ma'am... Do you know this person? I'll say no. I've never seen him before in my life. <laughs> he places a lit cigarette into an ashtray, walks into his bedroom, reaches behind its door, picks up the AR-15, snaps the magazine with 15 rounds, and slings the rifle around his left shoulder so it rests against his torso. Ready, he asks. <laughs> yeah, she says, grabbing her purse and following her husband out the door for an afternoon trip to Walmart to buy soda. It's Operation Dr. Thunder. We're going to be rolling out heavy. Uh, we've got uh, escorts uh, on the 2 and the 15, and we're going to be coming in hot. We need uh, air cover and uh, artillery support. Over. This is actually the sequel to Black Hawk Down, when a former Army Ranger gets caught underneath a errant uh, rascal scooter, <laughs> and the uh, President Hillary Clinton ignores his request for support. As he's pinned down and people take all the uh, cherry vanilla, Dr. Pepper. This is a really, the article goes on. I want to read more from the article. But before we do, it's just like, this is a really well done article because obviously like that, that opening scene there just has a beautiful rhythm. And I really enjoyed the characters of Jim and his, uh, his, his long suffering wife, Maria. Oh, poor um, Maria. I think we've all been a Maria at least once in our life. But um, the, the article goes on, and really what it does is have... Um, it, it's, it's funny, but it's actually a very kind of sobering portrait of a certain type of person and how they become the type of guy who carries a loaded AR-15 to go buy soda because he thinks it's dangerous or he thinks that, uh, that he's doing a public service in some way. Like, here, look, here's, a, here's another detail. It says, uh, as Jim has learned, it fits nicely between the front seats of a white minivan with peeling paint on the front and a bumper sticker on the back that says, I love law. 
<laughs> I I gotta love Law Brother. <laughs> gotta law, love it, brother. It's the best. Uh, Jim, it says Jim goes everywhere with his gun, if not the AR-15, then his sidearm, and is so reliant on one being close by that it surprises him to think that the majority of his life was lived otherwise. He was raised in a working class family in Chicago where he can't imagine living now because of its strict gun laws, but they didn't bother him then. He didn't hunt. He didn't fear for his safety. If his dad had a gun, no one knew. He grew up without a gun, went to church without a gun, married Maria without a gun, began raising two children without a gun, and settled into a life that felt as safe as it was defendable. But then it began unraveling, starting when he was fired from a trucking job days after telling Maria, who was pregnant with their first child, to quit her job and focus on the baby, that he could support them both. Their first bankruptcy filing wasn't far behind, then the second, then the third. Then they were moving to Florida, where Maria had gotten had family and where Jim got a job with a grocery chain. It transferred him to Winder, and he moved the family into a middle-class neighborhood struggling with crime and drugs. Um, so, yeah, it's like this, you know, he, he didn't grow up like this. It's like, how, this is, answers the question, like, how does a person become like this? Uh, before any of you say it, very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, yeah, we can't say anything to... Definitive, uh, obvious because this is just one dude, but I mean, doesn't it make sense? And this is the thing that baffles me about this long running argument that's been going on all election season about, like, well, is the problem with uh, white, poor white people racism, or is it because they're poor? Like, the idea that these are things that can be t- untangled from one another, like, right? You know, the, the very fact is that if people's lives are unstable, if they feel like their ability to, you know, fucking live and, and, and have a roof over their house, heads and sustain themselves and their family is threatened, they're going to reach out for things to reassert control of their lives and people to blame for it. And since we live in a culture that is absolutely suffused with white supremacy, that is, you know, in everything, in the air we breathe and every moment of our lives... Of fucking course, a lot of people are going to go to that in those kind of situations where they feel like that, and because gun ownership and sort of the idea of the of the of the lone uh, armed citizen defending his family and his hearth is so powerful, of fucking course, people are going to turn to that in order to feel like they have some control over themselves. So basically, all these pathological elements of American society will always be made worse. When people's economic conditions are more tenuous, I uh, no go ahead. I I, I have kind of a uh, a weirdly apolitical insight to this. Um, I I started doing Brazilian jiu jitsu and like seriously lifting weights when I was about nineteen, and uh, the first probably four months that I did it, as anyone does. You know, I would get my ass kicked in training a lot because you suck, you're panicking, you're thinking too much. And I got better in the next two months after that. But it didn't, you know, everyone always talks about how they get calmed from training. But it didn't do that for me for a little while. I was more tense than I ever was. I was always, like, when I would see, like, another guy, I would always think, like, just envision him envision like whichever guy like knocking me out or choking me or whatever the fuck because there is sort of a subconscious fear in most men of being dominated and most people will never train in any like form of combat but you get dominated enough and then you get better it will lay this fear because it happened to you and it's not that bad and you improve sort of like as a competitor but for me, it for a little while, I was like, oh, no, there are these, you know, I had gotten I had gotten my ass kicked in a fight before I ever started training, but I didn't have that same fear. But it sort of opened my like the more that I learned about fighting, the more that it made me afraid of all the different ways I could get humiliated in a fight. And then, you know, that eventually went away. I just kept training. And of course, wasn't 19, probably the worst age for a male to be. You get to you get to inoculate yourself to this fear by training, by growing older. Guns are different because it's not like you get to spar somebody with guns. <laughs> you're just you're building up, you're building up this arsenal. Then you see more and more people, you see more and more people with guns, you 
drive yourself crazy thinking about these scenarios, this active shooter scenario or a fucking suicide bomber or ISIS is invading your Walmart. And you get so obsessed with your this type of combat and your means of defense that you have to be tensed up at all times and ready to fight at all times because you've built this hypothetical up so much with no outlet for it. I will never train or get a gun and I'm totally ready to get killed by a terrorist because then I would be a famous as the stupid lib who made fun of terrorism and got killed. <laughs> and at least then I would live forever. Be, as a meme. Yeah, Do you know how exactly. many fucking elevator cocks would laugh at us if you got killed by a suicide bomber? Now this can't happen. Yeah. They'll be like, oh, terrorism's a big joke, huh? Where's one third of your show? <laughs> <laughs> well, th th this is after, you know, the week in which uh, some guy blew up a dumpster in Chelsea, which I thought was kind of a big joke. <laughs> so. That was hilarious. That was hilarious. And they all the elevator cocks were like, oh, are you laughing now? Yes, yeah. it's really funny. <laughs> it's actually pretty funny. It's really funny. I that mean, guy I was the biggest fucking fail dork on earth. That <laughs> yeah. fucking fat loser. He literally, he just, he lived in Jersey. He took the path into Manhattan and then he just dropped some bombs in dumpsters on the way to and from his path station. Just like he Can couldn't be bothered to like even detour from like the, the, his, his uh, commute because he's such a fucking loser. Yeah. It, it's like if Muhammad, if like Muhammad Atta, <laughs> he was like, uh, I really don't want to make the trip to LaGuardia. Uh, I think I'm just going to crash a uh, Cessna into an H&R block. <laughs> <laughs> fucking I mean, loser. As I, as I have told 200 women in DMs since this event occurred, you know, if I had been doing what I normally do that day, which is take a picture of me in the dumpster to make a point <laughs> about white genocide for Gavin McGinnis, I could have died. And I shouldn't be alone right now, and I should not not be seeing nipples right now. Uh, you know, obviously, things blowing up in a major American city, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not cool and good, okay? Well, you know, we, we, may, we may find the dark humor in it. It's actually not cool and good. Except for shows blowing up. <laughs> Genius <laughs> Compound, September 24th. Oh, my God. What, what if someone attacked our show? Wouldn't Holy shit. Really if we survive, <laughs> like, that would be so good for yeah, us. Yeah, if we survive, yeah, we, don't we, do that. Get, we'd be, we'd get to go on, like, Fox News. We'd get to meet Sean Hannity. It'd be amazing. Yeah. Hey, uh, guys, listeners, subscribers, do not tell anyone we're planning a false flag. <laughs> Keep it to yourselves. Sigh up. But uh, th the point is, you know, like the, the, the world can seem frightening and even more so when you are, as Matt was saying, uh, economically unstable and just generally a feeling of kind of dislocation and feeling out of control of your own life. Everything else in the world seems all the bit all the more out of control, and I just want to read, go back to the article and just read some examples of sort of what happened to Jim Cooley. He says uh, he lights a cigarette, feels the breeze from an open window because the air conditioner is broken, and takes a sip of soda. <laughs> I'm glad he got the soda. Yeah, <laughs> but thank uh, God. And by the way, his wife works in an air conditioner factory, and their air conditioner is broken. I just like that's an added just bonus. That's some fucking angle. That's some Marx and Engels shit. People, yeah, 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 people yeah. being exploited really to make machinery and objects that they can't afford to buy. And it says, uh, and he takes a sip of soda from a big mug that says Athens Regional Medical Center. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, again, we shouldn't laugh at this, but if you it, look, there is a certain grim humor here. It's a, it's a memento of sorts from the day in late 2008 when he emerged from that hospital with three stents in his heart. Debts worth $41,000 and a dawning realization that he was now disabled, broke, and would never work again. After the heart attack, he lost most of the circulation in his legs, received three more stents, and started using an electric scooter whenever he had to walk long distances. He told Maria he was all used up, a drag on the family. She should think about leaving him. But she wouldn't, even after the hospital sued him for unpaid medical bills, even after he was arrested when he carried a, a 380 pistol outside a school board meeting, even after he came home one day with an AR-15. He... He shot it at a nearby firing range and feeling a sense of control that had gone missing in his life, told Maria he could now keep the family safe. I got to say, this guy, I mean, yeah, he carries a gun around and everything, but I kind of feel like he's a bit of a poser because how has he not mounted a 50 caliber machine gun to the front of that scooter of his? 
Oh, it, I mean, and later on. in the article, it does talk about how he mounts uh, the gun on the scooter, Matt. It's not a 50 cal, but... Uh, no, you need to get the belt. Just you go, need belt-fed shit. <laughs> you need belt-fed stuff. I mean, you, need, you, you, need you, to turn, you need to turn it into a technical, like ISIS go, uses. Going, going back a little bit to my analogy with, uh, I guess, fighting, um, I wrote an article for Deadspin about like why MMA fighters believe weird shit and why they're attracted to MMA. We talked about that with uh, Jordan Breen. With Jordan Breen, up yeah. that episode. Well, you see kind of a similar thing. What, in a, if you feel you are completely disabused and not a member of the world and do not reap in any of its uh, any of the benefits of society and your life is just downhill and it will never get better, what will make you just not chew through your pillow and hang yourself like the ability to hurt or kill somebody? Well, yeah, it goes on in the article. It said... Um uh, this is from Maria's perspective. She says, at first she didn't understand the changes she saw in the man she married 24 years ago. Why did he suddenly want a gun when he never mentioned one before? Why did he get her one, too? Why did he put two four-inch knives inside the car's passenger side door? And why all the security cameras? Maria glances at the small screen beneath the rearview mirror. It shows feeds from surveillance cameras fixed inside the car that start recording when someone turns the ignition. Um, but Maria went along with all of it. She bought a 380 semi-automatic and has gotten used to taking it with her wherever she goes. Um, so much of her life involves accommodating him now, including just before they left for Walmart and he asked her to send a Facebook message to a local deputy about his plans. What do you want me to tell him, Maria asked. Say, hey buddy, I'm going to Walmart and I'm going to have my AR with me, so if any call comes over the radio, you know it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to... Uh, it says, uh, she messaged the deputy, then look at Jim's Facebook page. It bore pictures of her husband carrying guns and posts about a country dissolving into chaos and videos about people stopping intruders with guns, people killing burglars with guns, people shooting big guns, small guns, all kinds of guns that he watches late into the night. Uh, I, I want to read one last thing. It says... Uh, so she went along with that, too, and now here she is now, pulling into a parking spot outside of Walmart and her husband reaching for an AR-15 that he tells her sometimes he would have no problem using against, using against a thief breaking into their house or a violent protester in the streets of Milwaukee or a terrorist in Syria or, if necessary, even a stray dog on their lawn. What I like about that is, like, the, the declining slope of ambitions. You know, like, this is a guy who needs just a please, mobility just scooter to get around. Just let me kill something. Just let me kill something. Yeah. <laughs> Just anything. It says. By the way, good Jim, good luck with that with that bad circulation and uh, and you know like uh, dropsy or whatever the hell he has. I don't think he's gonna be able to like throw down accurately on any of these threats. Well, look, I mean that, that, that's all I want to read from the article. We, we're linked to it. It's it, it's a really good article. And like I said, if you can't find in the it, you know, it, it, look, it made me think like what what do we owe someone like Jim Cooley? Like you know how. Seriously, should we take him? And Matt, this is like you're talking about. This is like sort of a question that a lot of like you know liberals and people in the press are agonizing over themselves. Like you know, we can't look down on these you know benighted people, which is condescending in its own way. I mean, my attitude is, like we said, if you can't see the humor in this scenario of Jim Cooley and his trips to Walmart to buy soda, I mean, yeah, I I don't know what to say to you. It's, yeah, on it's the like same hand, yeah. if if you can read like the description of what his life is like and not feel for him, then I also don't understand you because there's yeah. a real sadness. There, yeah, there, it's, and, there's and there. two, there's sort of two traps that people get fall into and seem to be the only people who are stuck in those and the only ones who argue over this shit. And those are the people who on the one hand, just like basically are in a cocoon of their own sense of self congratulation and superiority to them. And they're just like these fucking idiots. They're so stupid. We don't, just let's forget about them. We can just pretend, you know, wait for them to die. But then on the other side, you've got these people who are like, hold on a minute, you know, these simple people hold a lot of wisdom. And it's like, actually, no, they're mostly retar idiots. <laughs> uh, and like, we have to be able to say that. We have to be able to say that they are, you know, like most people, kind of dumb and uh, reacting sort of knee jerk to the world around them. And they don't have a lot of ability to evaluate things on sort of an abstract level that's true of most people that's true of us most of the time certainly when we're in distress that's not i mean i don't think anybody even the most you know uh, uh coastal elite person is ever going to be their most detached and uh, rational self 
when they're in a state of distress. Uh, but I yeah, think and that the- especially also like when your life sucks. Yeah. Like because th- I mean I think like that's at bottom what we're talking about here, and like this is sort of how I was thinking about it. Like, you know, look like Jim Cooley. You know, obviously, like th- this guy is like the Trump voter. He's obsessed with this idea that America is falling into chaos. And when you, you know, listen to a lot of the rhetoric that's coming from the right, you know, either from Trump supporters or even the never the elevator, uh, the never Trump elevator boys, it- it's this idea that like you know uh, America and, e- and even Western civilization is falling apart. You know, they traffic in the birth and death of like entire cultures and civilizations, and in the way that they mean it they're almost entirely wrong. I mean, like, because, you know, rationally we can say it's probably now, it's probably technically safer to live in America than maybe any time in the world. But then again, it's also difficult to talk about because when compared to any other, like, comparable first world nation, America's insanely violent. But that being said, like, from the other side, there's like the kind of, you know, the Hillary Dems, this idea that, you know, America's already great or things are great. This is a, this, <laughs> these immigrants who come to America, they know America's great and they want to be here because it's a great country. And I think what it comes down to is that, look, uh, American culture and civilization isn't falling apart. It's not like, you know, Mad Max or something like that. But you just can't get away from the fact that life just sucks. Like it may not be, your life may not be in existential danger, but it just may be an existential boredom and just, you know, misery. That and, and the boredom thing is very important because that is a huge driver of this guy's kind of paranoia. Absolutely. I mean, the very fact is turning every trip to Walmart into the Benghazi extraction mission <laughs> makes your life exciting. Otherwise, you're yeah. just going to get fucking soda at Walmart. And if that's, your, if that's the highlight of your day, my God, how don't you kill yourself? But if it also doubles as this... Uh, you know, this operator's uh, trip into potential danger and that you're locked and ready for, then you got that constant drip of adrenaline through the whole thing and it, it gives it power and panache and, and all that good shit. No, I was going to say, I think that really describes a lot of the, the kind of open carry person because, uh, or the people, you know, look, I, if you want to have a gun because you think it protects your home, I don't see what's wrong with that, but like, Getting into it to the degree, I just saw something the other day that 50% of all the guns in America are owned by 3% of the people. Yeah. And, you know, like, like there are less and less people are actually buying guns, but a, f- a small amount of people are buying a fuckload of guns. And like these people, I think it's because like the risk heuristic through which they see the world is fundamentally broken. Yeah. Like, well, and, there's and, and, a- but, but like, as you said, Matt, there's like the, the reward from that is sort of feeling like you're in an action movie all the time. Yeah, absolutely. It's awesome. I mean, there's a slogan on the on the gun in the gun circuit, and this is the thing you hear all the time. It's how many guns do I own? I own more guns than I need, but fewer than I want. <laughs> Which is on its face an insanely idiotic thing to say, but people are very proud of it. They got fucking bumper stickers with that shit on it. Because like and- every gun is like a little more manliness and every gun is a little more danger and and yeah, well, a, a, another brick in sort of this imaginarium that you're creating. And he, and you know, and here's the other thing that I think a lot of liberals don't get about guns is that they are fun. Oh like, hell yeah! Shooting guns is, is fun as hell, like objectively, you know. But I don't know, taking them to Walmart, maybe not. But I would say that the the way to square the circle and deal with this how to how to handle these people's uh, stuff isn't to condescend to them or to just heap them with scorn it's to just propose social policies that will help them regardless of their shitty personal views absolutely and some of them are going to hold on to being assholes a good chunk of them because that's their identity is based around being assholes assholes. but like maybe other one maybe other people feel like they don't give as much of a shit about that they feel less compelled to organize their lives around that because they have a sense of control over them their lives which they would get if they had more, uh, you know, a, a, a more social grounding and more, more of a safety net. And the thing is, is that you you don't need to get peel off that many of them to have an electoral coalition with other groups that could be winning. It's not like you have to get them en masse. You Which just is have why to cut th- off cut off a nice chunk and you're good. No, I was going to say this is why I thought the article was so good because it does give a portrait of a guy who didn't start out like this at all like you know he didn't come from a background where like everyone had guns all the time he he became this way and was sort of driven crazy by 
the circumstances in his life. And what I, when we began this, I said, like, what do we owe the, the Jim Cooleys of the world, at least from our perspective? And I would just say one in which you don't get $40,000 in medical bills that, like, pretty much blows away your future because you had a heart attack. I mean, that, that's the best solution I can think of. Indeed. Uh, I actually think the solution is katanas. <laughs> Replace all guns with katanas. We need better uh, a Bushido training. Or yeah, everyone in America, free Bushido. Either Bushidos or we go the other way and we just put Samantha B on giant screens in town <laughs> oh, squares God. in every city in America until everyone is woke. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, woke plus, which is when you lecture everybody else, but your husband works hard to keep the wrong type of black people <laughs> oh, out of your yes. kid's school. <laughs> Fuck Samantha B. I stand with Ross Dude Hat. Only we can beat up Ross. <laughs> Fuck George Allen Swagger B. Fuck Samantha B. Fuck all of Ross's enemies, except for us. 